The talk now is about law and its corruption in Nazi Germany. Um, and we are in a courthouse, the Robert H. Jackson United States Courthouse. Uh, we are in a legal system of Western constitutional liberal democracy. We are in a world, the post-war world, the 70-year-old world of international modern law, rights, institutions, protections, and commitments. Is the threat of law underneath this? Um, this is the Reichstag fire. Uh, and I said that's the point that provokes the emergency decree in 1933. What you need to recognize across this whole span, but it really becomes clear at this birth moment, is that Nazi Germany was a dual state. It was both the government, the civil government, the public institutions of government, including a regular judicial system, and Hitler, the Nazi party, and the arbitrariness and force of its power its maniacal obsessions and devices and objectives. And those two things merging, in a sense, so that party and ideology and Nazism captures and conquers and becomes the state and all of its institutions, including law, including the judiciary. This merging of the dual nature of Nazi Germany is referred to as coordination, such a nice, soft, term. In other contexts, a laudable thing, right? Um, you can imagine a sort of a band director talking about the different instruments needing to achieve coordination, or a sports team coach looking for coordination. Um, the Nazis coordinate the state, meaning pull it in and subvert it and coordinate it to Nazism. And I'd like to take you, uh, briskly in parts, through 17 legal steps, just in a chronological order that is about that process of coordination. The German legal and justice system moving from what it was under Weimar, which is something that in general terms represents what you're familiar with, indeed what this courthouse represents, serious jurists, established law, professional norms, orderly proceedings, public accountability, commitment to democratic values, etc., and pulling that all in to something else. First, intellectual and ideological effort. Changing minds, inserting new ideas. That's Mein Kampf, a big bestseller across the 1920s in every German home. An unreadably horrible book, not just for its content, but its prose, I must say. But an idea, right? Everything is ideas, good ideas or bad ideas. In this early period, the Academy of German Law an institution that's like a bar association or a law institute, and legal theorists, Carl Schmidt and others, urge a number of things that are messages and are teaching and are themes that become influential. The need to Nazify German law, in other words, coordination, swallowing up. The cleansing from German life of Jewish influence. This is a legal project. This is a problem that the law needs to address these theoreticians say. And the importance of judges becoming part of it. One phrase that captures it is that judges should be governed by, quote, healthy folk sentiment. In other words, our German way of t thinking, the true Volk way of thinking about the problems and issues that come before judges and courts and decide those things those ways. A second step in response to this event is the Reichstag Fire Decree. This is an emergency decree suspending parliamentary government, suspending division of power, making Hitler an unrestricted minority party representing now nationally, uniformly empowered chancellor. That's February of 1933. That's a month after he's been designated and assumed the office of chancellor. On that same day, another decree, a third development, is the reinterpretation of something called protective custody. Now, protective custody is a legal reality in this country and in most liberal Western rule of law states. Um, and it's got contexts and procedures and a kind of accountability that's ordinarily built into it through judicial supervision. Under this form of protective custody, the February 1933 German decree, there will be no more judicial review of arrests. Forget about the judges and forget about the courts. This now belongs entirely to the police. The police now have the power, pursuant to this decree, to arrest 
real and potential political and ideological enemies of the regime. Just lock them up. Identify them, seize them, and lock them up. And of course, what to do with them? Well, an architecture begins to develop coming out of this decree. They will be confined in new detention facilities, specifically for the purposes of these prisoners that we refer to as concentration camps. These will be under the authority of the Schutzstaffel, the SS, the elite police guard of the Nazi state. Again, party having merged, having coordinated, having taken over the policing function. The first of these is Dachau, a small town north of Munich, uh, slightly south of Nuremberg. The camp was located in an old munitions factory. Uh, and in its early days, in the spring of 1933, it was not a high architecture, high security, um, sophisticated facility as it later became. It was kind of a big, if you'll excuse the phrase, chicken coop, is how one survivor has described it. Kind of a crummy fence, some guards, a perimeter, some housing, uh, and a lot of people arriving, being delivered by the police. A fourth development, just one month later, March of 1935. German law is changed to provide for the imposition and implementation of a much more aggressive death penalty. By law, this becomes a killing state as a form of punishment, which it has not very much been up until that point in time. Step number five, also in 1933. The creation of special courts, not just the ordinary pre-existing courts, Nazi courts, and Nazi reliable courts. These are established throughout Germany to try sensitive cases, political matters that can't go into the regular pre-existing system. So for example, in 1934, the regular court in Berlin hears and conducts the trial of the people who were arrested for this act of arson, the Reichstag trial fire and they were acquitted because it seems it's an enduring mystery who actually did this. They rounded up some random guys and they didn't actually have evidence of their perpetration. In response to that acquittal, Hitler orders the creation of a new people's court. Remember folk sentiment? A people's court in Berlin to try treason and other politically important cases. That people's court of Berlin comes to be the, code of, the court of Roland Freisler He's on film presiding in 1945 over the trial of the plotters of the July 20th, uh, July 20th, 1944 assassination attempt on Hitler and screaming and berating at the defendants in that foreordained show trial that resulted in executions. Um, and then in an act of something of much higher power, Freisler is killed in early 1945 in an Allied bombing. Other jurists who are part of this development, Kurt Rotenberger, Franz Schlegelberger, Joseph Allstadter. I mention those three names because those men live. And those men are arrested, and those men become defendants at Nuremberg in the 1947 trial of Nazi jurists and prosecutors for perversion of law. That's the so-called justice trial. It's the trial that's portrayed in the film, Justice at Nuremberg. And I'll talk more about that in my next lecture. Step number six. The end of independent professional associations. Erie County Bar Association is an independent professional association. This decree says all associations in involved in the administration of justice cease to exist independently and are now to be merged into, the name tells it all, the National Socialist League of German Jurists. Coordination, absorption, conquering. Step seven, April of 1933 the purging of Jews and others from the legal profession. By decree of Adolf Hitler, all Jewish and all socialist, and of course, that's Nazi-identified socialist, judges, lawyers, and other court officers are discharged from their jobs and from professional status. Step number eight, July of 1933. This is all in the first six months of Hitler as uh, fully empowered chancellor. A law bars the founding of new political parties. Step number nine, August of 1934, a year later, a law requiring a loyalty oath by all government officials. Now that's already a de-Judaized, de-socialized government bureaucracy. The public servants are already purged of those enemies. In addition, now loyalty oaths are required. 
And I've gotten through those nine steps and I haven't yet mentioned the Nuremberg Laws. Well, step number 10. It took two years, but in September of 1935, at the party's rally in Nuremberg, in a special session of the now fully Nazi-controlled Reichstag, the Nuremberg Laws are passed. There are actually two laws under this title of Nuremberg Laws. The first is the Reich Citizenship Law. It revokes Reich citizenship for Jews. Previously stripped of professions and lots of other official status, now these are no longer German citizens. That means no more right to vote, and that means no right to hold any kind of public office. The second Nuremberg Law is titled The Law for the Protection of German Blood and Honor. It makes a crime of, quote, racial infamy. Racial infamy is Jews marrying or having sexual relations with persons of, quote, German blood. <coughs> and to make that law meaningful, of course, it needs to define who is a Jew. In 1935, these laws, and particularly the law for the protection of German blood and honor, making racial infamy a crime, results in these definitions of who is a Jew. Uh, this is a complicated German language chart. The gist of it is that the law defines one as a Jew if three or four of his grandparents were Jewish. And of course, what determined that? Whether three or four of their grandparents had been Jewish. And what determined that? And we're going up and up and up the family tree. Well, it's some bureaucratic official determining who is a Jew. Step number 11. The fall of 1935, the law for the protection of the hereditary health of the German people. This sort of is a follow-on to the Nuremberg Law. It requires prospective marriage partners to get from public health authorities a certificate of fitness to marry. These certificates, of course, are denied to people who have hereditary diseases, who have contagious diseases, and who wish to marry in violation of the Nuremberg Laws. Number 12, this is a quick one. Um, November of 1935, the Nuremberg Laws are extended to Roma and Sinti, the gypsies, and to Negroes, to blacks and their offspring. Just in case we overlooked something, the Nazis add that uh, as exclusionary categories. Step 13, December of 1936, the Supreme Court of Germany, sir, responding to your question, approves the legality of the Nazi race laws, the Nuremberg Laws. Step 17, a series of measures to impoverish Jews. For example, Jews are required to carry identity cards. Jews with first names that are not recognizably Jewish were given by law new middle names to make it clear. John Israel Barrett, or Jane Sarah Doe. This is an example of a pass stamped, of course, with the red J for Jew uh, that was issued in this time period. Jews are required to register their ownership of property. For confiscation purposes, of course, this immediately will be very useful, but first, list your assets. Jewish businesses are required to Aryanize. That means dismissing Jewish <coughs> managers and workers, and that means selling, often at fire sale prices, to non-Jewish owners. I had the very sobering experience the first time I went to Nuremberg in 2004 uh, to have someone point out, my German, not good, um, someone pointed out on an awning of a little shop, a little kind of flag, a little sign. And it was a short phrase, but it had the year 1938 in it. And they said, do you know what that is? And I looked at it and thought about it and I said, you know, I see the year, but no, I don't know. He said, it basically says, family owned and operated since 1938. For many, many, many small businesses in Germany, 2004 was the 75th anniversary of the founding of the family business. With no consciousness of whose family's business it had been before, the law required that business to be de -Aryan, to be Aryanized, to be de-Judaized, and it became an Arian's bakery, or an Arian's tailor shop, or an Arian's shoe store, etc. And we'll return to shoe stores. Another part of these impoverishment measures, Jewish doctors were forbidden to treat non-Jews. So you now had impoverished Jews and impoverished 
Jewish doctors basically coupled together. And that becomes unsustainable. Lawyers are prohibited from practicing law altogether. Just in case we missed that in some previous point, the Nazis say they reiterate that here. Step 15, September of 1939. Of course, this is the month of the invasion of Poland. The Ordinance Against Public Enemies, also known as the Folk Pest Law. The Folk Pest Law. The Folk were the Volk, the real Germans, and the pests, of course, were the others. And we'll come back to one dimension of what was construed as a violation of the Folk Pest Law. Step 16, not visible at the time, of course, but I want to put this in the timeline very explicitly. January 20, 1942, about a dozen high bureaucrats spanning the military and other bureaucratic forms of Nazi Germany meet in a beautiful villa on a lake south of Berlin, Wannsee, and in one two-hour meeting, they plan and agree and go forth to implement the final solution of the Jewish question. All of these measures, and largely confined to Ger German Jews, are inadequate given the conquered, captured Eastern European Jews and the continent's Jewish problem. And with Reinhard Heydrich presiding, that meeting is a conference and it's memorialized in one memo which survived and was found in 1947 to plan and carry out the extermination of 12 million people. Finally, step 17, October 1942, during the depths of the war, a last legal decree, just in case judges needed reminding, letter guidance that all sentencing should be particularly harsh and severe and fast. In other words, less trial, more punishment. Now, that's the landscape of the law being perverted. Um, we talk about Nazi law, but think about the phrase as itself something that is um, an internal contradiction. Because, of course, any system that claims to be law is only to be judged by its content and its values. And what I've just listed, I think, is abhorrent, indefensible content and the absence of all human values. It doesn't deserve the name law, but of course it masquerades. And it's the device of people. Of course power, the party, and the state, and the police, and the force behind it, but in the trenches, lots and lots and lots of individuals. Lawyers, judges, civilians, if you will. And accommodation, surrender, or in spots, resistance. Today, Germany, and Nuremberg particularly, is third generation. And the third generation doesn't have any explaining to do, doesn't have any uh, apologizing to do, doesn't have anything but the same questions that we have. And what they have done with it, I must say, I find deeply impressive. And I'm a partner in many ways with colleagues in Nuremberg in the institutions that memorialize and teach and embrace the legacy, not of Hitlerism, not of National Socialism, not of the war, of the Nuremberg trials and the return of real law to this land that now embraces the legacy of human rights. The rule of law then and there or here and now is just ours is just a matter of what the people will do and will be. Is an ability of an individual to sort of think independently, to stand separately, to refuse to just be a cog, to take only messages from outside without thinking about it. And that's our hope. And I'm very glad to be here with you today to, I hope, contribute to what that does in the future. Thank you and I welcome any questions.